Okay, we're studying no idols today. Imagine with me a large wedding uh, in a large church. Uh, the people are dressed in their best outfits, and uh, the preacher and the groom have taken their places on the stage uh, in their uh, best outfits, and suddenly the music starts, and the bride comes marching down the aisle on her husband's, uh, on her father's arm and she's given away. The preacher preaches a message uh, about love and marriage and, and uh, all of this. He does the vows, and then he says, if there's anyone who knows any reason why these two shall not be married, let him speak now forever hold his peace. Well, in the back, there's a young lady with a baby that stands up. And she makes her way out of the aisle, comes down to the front. The bride is shocked. The groom, sure, he doesn't know her. And all of a sudden, the preacher says, yes, ma'am, may I help you? And she says, yes. I can't hear. Can I sit up front? And <laughs> That's not the story I wanted to tell, okay? <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, imagine a, this scene, a small, simple wedding uh, in a country church, and uh, everyone arrives dressed in their best, and the preacher and the groom have taken their place on the stage, and suddenly the music, a wedding march starts, and everyone rises to their feet and makes uh, she makes her way down front on her father's arm, and she appears so happy. And uh, the, uh, she's just practically glowing. And then the groom, he's all smiles, and the preacher traditionally gives the bride, uh, uh, which, uh, I mean, the daddy traditionally gives the bride uh, and the brief, brief message on uh, uh, love, joys of marriage. Then the preacher leads the groom in his vows. He says, Mike, do you commit yourself to Sarah? Take her as your wife, promising to love, uh, cherish, protect her, and provide for her, uh, guard her reputation, give her undenying love, and uh, remain faithful unto her so long as you both shall live. And he says, uh, I do, looks in her eyes and says, I do. Then the preacher turns to the woman and says, uh, now for your vows. But she interrupts him and says, if you don't mind, I have written my own vows. And he says, by all means, the preacher says, go ahead. And she begins and says, uh, uh, Mike, honey, I love you. And... Uh, I'm so looking forward to our future together. And you've always been there for me. You picked me up when I was down, encouraged me when I felt like quitting, and you're my hero, my friend. I promise to love you, stand by you, and support you for the rest of my life. There's only one thing that I ask of you. One day a year, I want to be single again. I want to... Uh, be able to spend time with old boyfriends, go guy hunting, clubbing, whatever comes up for the day, and uh, says, what do you think about that? Well, uh, can you imagine the groom's reaction to that uh, cra crazy proposal? No groom, no uh, bride wants a part-time commitment from a spouse. Uh, they, it just, you know, anything that would ruin their marriage. Uh, you think about it, you married ladies, you don't want your husband spending time uh, in an internet chat room with another woman. Uh, you don't want him carrying uh, around a picture of another woman uh, in his wallet. Uh, it's just unheard of. And guys, you don't uh, 
we don't want our wives uh, uh, calling up other men on the phone, meeting up with old boyfriends. And, uh, we don't want her flirting with co-workers uh, or anything like that. It's just unheard of. Why? Because we don't want uh, anything creeping in that might gradually steal our spouse's uh, devotion from us. And the same is true of God. You know, God wants our full devotion and uh, in our relationship to him. Uh, he doesn't want you to worship any other gods. Uh, last week we looked at commandment number one and we studied that God wants to be number one in our lives, the sole occupant of the throne of our heart. He doesn't want to be a part-time partner. He doesn't want uh, anything like that. He wants, uh, doesn't want 51% of our devotions. He wants the whole shooting match, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, uh, that's uh, something that uh, we have to consider when we think about our relationship with God. So today, as we look closely at the second commandment, we find that God not only wants us to worship him alone, but uh, he wants us to worship him for who he is. And that is important. So the second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, says, Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, we've all seen pictures of uh, ancient idols, uh, people of other religions bow down to uh, different things, you know. We've seen the Sphinx, we've seen Buddha, We've seen Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism has 330 million gods and goddesses uh, at this time. I've been all over the world. I've had the privilege to be in these temples and in these places of worship. And I've seen people do some strange things uh, in their devotion to their God. I've seen them burn money uh, to their God. I've seen them bring all kinds of offerings to their God. And they think that that is going to appease their God. We've all shaken our heads at this, and, uh, you know, we've said, well, we're not that foolish. Uh, we're not going to worship some pe piece of metal or wood. Uh, uh, so most of us probably think that we've got a pretty good handle on uh, this uh, uh, fifth, uh, second commandment. Uh, you know, we're pretty much got it whipped. And however, the New Testament finds Jesus teaching that the breaking of the commandments takes place in our heart and minds and uh, long before it takes place in our body. Uh, for instance, Matthew, the fifth chapter, 21 and 22, says, You have heard it said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall, ki uh, shall be, uh, whosoever, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say thy fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, this commandment says don't murder. Uh, uh, but Jesus says we're in the wrong if we uh, harbor anger uh, in our hearts toward another person. It's the same thing as committing murder. Then the Bible says in Chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, you've heard it said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you 
that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with, uh, with her uh, already in his heart. And so this commandment says don't commit adultery. But Jesus said to look lust, lustfully uh, after another person, be it man or woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So we see that these commandments uh, also apply to the heart and what's happening in the heart. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, equal consequence, and covetry, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. So you can't get away from these things. These things are idolatry, and uh, you cannot cut it any other way. <coughs> Anything that you give yourself to, especially in abandonment, becomes an idol or a god in your heart. Uh, many today worship all kinds of uh, uh, idols. They worship alcohol. They worship uh, uh, sex, they worship money or even family, anything to which you give your heart and soul to becomes your God. There's also a probability that it will lead to our changing the labels on sinful activities. When Moses didn't come down off the mountain immediately, Aaron collects gold and uh, at the request of the people, he forms a golden calf and calls it a god. As a matter of fact, he even identifies it as the god that brought them out of slavery. Now, that's not true. It was Moses at the command of God that brought the children of Israel out of slavery. And so the people start worshiping a golden calf, then they start drinking and partying, and soon... Things had turned into a great big orgy. And, uh, but the people didn't think they were doing anything wrong. Uh, it happens every time. You know, you, when people start thinking of God as something that he is not, then they begin doing and allowing things that God would not want them to do or would not allow them to do. And so... You have to put things in proper perspective. Then he says that God is a jealous God. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5b says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, what does that mean when it says God is jealous? You know, the Hebrew word jealous means to become intensely rid. It seems to be linked to the changing of the color of the face. And when we think of the characteristics of God, uh, jealousy is not one that immediately leaps into our mind. Uh, yet five times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word quana, translated jealousy, is used to describe God. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think of God is a jealous God, but God is jealous. Uh, jealousy is not like our jealousies. Uh, God's jealousy is always purely motivated. Uh, God's jealousy not only brought, uh, brought on, uh, uh, God's jealousy is not brought on by uh, selfishness or uh, threatening self-esteem or fear of loneliness. God's jealousy concerns itself with our well-being. You can mark that down. Whenever God says, I am a jealous God, he is thinking of us. And so God wants the best for us. God knows that if we carry around uh, ideas that are related to him with a wrong mental image, uh, it's going to mean trouble. You can't get away from it. And let me list for you some of the pitfalls and danger of worshiping the right God in the wrong way. Uh, I don't know if you've ever visited Hollywood or uh, visited a TV set 
uh, it's strange. I had the uh, privilege early in my life to visit the uh, uh, set of uh, gun, gun smoke. And uh, boy, was I really surprised. Uh, everything looked so real and, and uh, uh, so perfect, but yet you open the door to a building or a store and there's nothing there. It's all fake. And, you know, you just, you can't imagine something looking so perfect and yet all being fake. And uh, when, when our hearts and minds, make, we make God to, out to be something he's not, then expect disappointments. Expect disappointments. Uh, there's always those people who carry with them the belief that God will grant them uh, whatever they have enough faith for. They, they pray to God and, and uh, uh, they expect God to answer their prayer. And in doing so, they've erected a false image of God. God, uh, disappointment awaits them just like it did that old TV Western set. Uh, you can almost see it coming, can't you? You know, the disappointment when God doesn't give them what they ask for. And uh, worshiping the right God in the wrong way, when anticipated answers don't come, these people s seem upset with themselves because of their lack of faith or they're mad at God that for not meeting their expectations or even both, you know, they're, dis they're disappointed with God. They're disappointed with themselves. And let's bring this idea home. When a person begins that, uh, to think that God doesn't care, uh, then they don't attend worship services in the local church uh, body like they should, you know. Uh, a person who will not make uh, worship priority or re rarely attend regular church services. They skip many of them. That's, I'm going to say this, but that's one of the reasons I'm kind of against TV on church. We broadcast our services, we broadcast our uh, Sunday school, but, you know, people get in the habit of if something comes up and they're a little late or something, well, I'll just stay home and watch it. And that's the convenient thing to do. But you're not gathering yourselves together like the Bible says. There's something about corporate worship that uh, is just, you can't beat it. And God does not want us watching it at home. So, I'm, I'm against that. And people who imagine that God doesn't consider, consider homosexuality as a sin, then they push for legalized homosexual marriage. And let, let me just uh, right quick throw in a verse of scripture here. I thought of it and uh, I want to bring it to you. It's not on your, uh, uh, not on your, uh, Well, I was going to bring it up, but I, there it is. Okay. It says, uh, without, un uh, without understanding, this is in Romans, the first chapter, and uh, verse number 31, without natural standing, uh, covenant breakers, without natural affection, uh, wait a minute. Okay, here we go. For this cause, uh, God gave them up to vile affections. Even uh, their women did change the natural use into that which was against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned 
in their lust one toward another, men with men, uh, working that which is unseemly, unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now, there's no question about what he's talking about here. Women leaving the natural use of the body, men uh, lusting after men, men with men, and doing that which is just, you know, uh, you can't get away with it. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And so uh, I'm sorry about throwing that in, but I did. <laughs> uh, but uh, then God is all about love. Uh, some imagine that God is all about love and about, not about justice. So they think and act as if everybody is going to heaven and there's no sin uh, that you have to account for. And as a result, they don't bother to talk to anybody about Jesus, uh, no matter which uh, way you come at it, uh, whether you make God out to be something he isn't, sin is the result. And it's because they are worshiping a God of their own making. Then sin affects our family. Uh, Exodus 25 and 6, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the, uh, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them which love me and keep my commandments. Now, don't get the wrong idea here. Because God uh, is not going to punish your children and your grandchildren and their grandchildren uh, for the sins that you commit. Uh, these words about punishing the sins of the third and fourth generation does not mean that God will uh, uh, punish our kids and grandkids for the personal sins that we commit. Uh, your kid, kids and grandkids won't answer for your sins, but they will be affected uh, positive, positively or negatively uh, for your life's decisions. Uh, perhaps you could best picture it as the domino effect. Verse 5 is talking about our actions having a spiritual domino effect. God doesn't want us to worship him in the wrong way because God knows that our actions have a far-reaching result. And so he knows that the lax attitude uh, of our relationship with him more than likely will affect our children and our grandchildren. They'll pick up the same attitude from us. Uh, let's say the first domino that uh, uh, a dad de uh, developing a habit or skipping the worship service. He doesn't come uh, on a regular basis. <coughs> the first uh, domino is the kid, his kid, who figures if it's not important to dad, uh, he didn't have to go either. And neither, uh, he says, neither do I. So the third domino is a grandchild. And if he never taken to church, he turns out to be an agnostic. And maybe his child will even be an atheist. And it's not that God punish, punishes the second and third and fourth generation for sins committed by, by the first, but that God <laughs> keeps seeing the same kind of sins committed by the second and third and fourth generation. Now, luckily, uh, the chain can be broken. How many of you had lost grandparents? Our lost parents, one, two, yeah. You got, you've broken the chain, see, so to speak. And it can be done, but it's not an easy thing uh, to break the chain and follow the Lord. Why is idol worship so terrible? Why does God make such a fuss over it? Well, here's the bottom line. We become like that which we worship. And Psalms 
135, 15 through 18, says, <coughs> excuse me, says, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouth. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. So God doesn't want our lives to become ruined. Uh, remember, he is a jealous God, jealous for our affections, jealous that our affections are uh, wholly committed to him and that he doesn't want us to worship worthless idols and that's why he doesn't want us to cling to false ideas of him. Then the cure for idolatry. He says uh, the cure for idolatry is having an encounter with the true and living God. Uh, we are called to turn from idolatry and to worship God. I guess Martin Luther had it right when he said, the whole of the Christian life is to be one of repentance. Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, how gracious of God uh, to often use conflicts to relieve, reveal our idols. Uh, he does this because he knows that he's the only thing that can satisfy us. And the Lord wants our hearts, uh, our worship, and all of our affections. Uh, Psalm 73, verse 25 says, Whom I have in heaven, but uh, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Uh, the heart of man is, as John Calvin described it, an idol-making factory. And boy, that is true. Uh, uh, then the way in which we, uh, which those idols are destroyed should make, uh, be of the utmost importance to us. Romans chapter 12 uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, because that which, uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, become, became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping, th creeping things. So that's what God is saying. Uh, Jesus is the cure for I our idolatry. Uh, God's Son uh, took to himself flesh and blood so that he might bear the penalty of our idolatry and uh, uh so that he might bear the penalty of our idolatry in his own body on the tree. Uh, then he rose bodily from the dead, and the Father now commands us to worship Jesus. Uh, what idols are you harboring in your heart? Simple question. Uh, uh, are you given affection and labors and created things, money, family, etc.? How are we to keep ourselves from idols? And uh, remedy is only to be found in the person, finished, uh, person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. You can't get it beyond that. And take heed, the dangers of falling into idolatry are always before us. Those who are self-assured and proud uh, are the most successful, successful, successful. Those who have a personal experience with God's divine deliverance can overcome and come can become overconfident 
and copper and lead. We must remember that God is against us having anything in our lives that we worship instead of him, and we must serve him with all our heart, mind, and soul. That is the immediate cure.